Namaskar. Welcome and welcome and welcome to this series of masterclass which we have and this series of masterclass has been specially crafted for you. The most important, well I would say, uh, entities for anybody to have a pregnancy are three things. The ova, the sperm, in fact the embryo and the endometrium. So this could vary in every human being and to have a pregnancy naturally with IUI, with IVFXC, we need to optimize the sperm and the ova. So Dr. Jatin and I were one day just talking to each other and we decided to have a master class and a master class where we have a series of lectures on how to optimize the ova and the sperm for a natural pregnancy and IUI, one, for IVI fixie, two, and what lifestyle modifications can we suggest to our patients and how lifestyle affects the ova and the sperm in a very holistic manner is the third. So the first master class is on natural pregnancy, the second is on ART and the third is on lifestyle. So I welcome you to the first master class which begins now. Good evening everyone. This is Dr. Sonal Mehta, Lead Medical Advisor in TAS. Uh, I welcome you all to, to, to today's uh, webinars. In TAS Women Health, being a knowledge partner, has organized today's webinars. Today's webinars are on optimizing OVA in natural pregnancy and IUI given by eminent faculty Dr. Jatin Shah sir. And another one is optimizing sperms in natural pregnancy and IUI given by eminent faculty Dr. Uh, Sunil Jindal sir. Uh, Dr. Jatin Shah sir, uh, he, he is a well-known uh, faculty MD, DGO, gold medalist, director Mumbai Fertility Clinic and IVF Center dedicated to the treatment of infertile couples help to establish many uh, IVF centers in the um, whole country and uh, he has many awards and uh, in, in student days as well and in his practice and he has pioneered um, many IVF centers uh, uh, when the uh, IVF was in initial stage in our country. With this intro, uh, short introduction, I welcome you sir, Dr. Chatin Shah sir and uh, Dr. Jindal. Uh, Dr. Sunil Jindal, he is MS, DNB, he is Chief Consultant and uh, uh, assist, uh, of Assisted Reproductive Medicine Specialist at Jindal Hospital, Scientific Director at Madhu Jindal Memorial Test Tube Baby Merit and Vice Chancellor, Delhi Isa, Delhi IAG, Gold Medal of Best uh, Postgraduate MA, MC, New Delhi and uh, he has uh, many awards to his uh, uh, records and many publications to, uh, he has done. And with this, I welcome you, sir, Dr. Sunil Jindal, sir. Uh, and uh, following this, uh, we'll have session by Dr. Jatin Shah, sir, first, that is on optimizing OVA in natural pregnancy and IUI. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, dearest Dr. Sonal, uh, a medical advisor to INTAS, my distinguished and uh, co-speaker and dear friend, Dr. Sunil Jindal. Uh, all the support team of Intas Eva, who always gives us such uh, wonderful academic platforms to talk on. And of course, all our dear delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends. It's indeed a pleasure to be here today. And uh, today we have a slightly different topic in as to we are actually going to focus on getting the most competent oocyte, whether you are doing a natural cycle with timed intercourse or a stimulated cycle with timed intercourse or a stimulated cycle with IUI. How should you go about ensuring that you have a competent oocyte so that you have a best quality embryo and a good take-home baby rate. Of course, first we need to remember and understand this slide that why is oocyte importance uh, com competency so important? Remember that the oocyte is the main determinant of the embryo developmental competence in women. It delivers half the chromosomal complement to the embryo, but remember that the maternal and paternal genomes are neither symmetrical nor equal in their contributions to the final outcome and the fate of the embryo. Unlike the paternal genome, the maternal genome carries a much heavier footprint as far as aging and parental aging is concerned. We know that age is the single best predictor of reproductive outcome and that the oocyte is the focus of this reproductive aging. 
But remember that the oocyte transmits not only the mother's nuclear, but also her mitochondrial genome to the embryo and mitochondrial DNA is known to be especially susceptible to aging. So when we talk of competence of the oocyte, it's not only genetic competency, but also mitochondrial competency, so as to ensure that you have a normal, healthy live birth. <clears throat> of course, before we jump into ovarian stimulation, uh, we must remember that it's very important, especially when you're dealing with a modern uh, young couple, that you go into a little bit of the history and correct a few lifestyle things which could be affecting their oocyte quality. Ensure, especially in the PCOS, that they have a balanced, healthy diet, which usually should consider, of course, all of you are familiar, about 25% of the carbs, 25% of protein, but 50% should be vegetables and salads. Also for PCOS and obese patients, you must make sure that they have a low glycemic index diet so that you get the best mitochondria in the oocytes. Folate supplementation, we are all familiar, of course, that 0.4 milligrams daily for all women of reproductive age in the preconception and through pregnancy. And this dose should be higher in high risk women, that is four to five milligrams, especially if there is a history of a child with a neural tube defect, and all the other indications such as taking medication for epilepsy or if she is diabetic or obese, then you might need a higher folate supplementation. Thyroidism, hypothyroidism and hyper both should be controlled adequately prior to moving on to ART or ovarian stimulation. Ensure that free T3, T4 are in the normal or upper part of the reference range and TSH is not elevated too much or over suppressed when you begin your treatments. So you must aim for a TSH of maybe less than 2.5, which is the most uh, modern guideline for thyroxine replacement during pregnancy. And regular monitoring of thyroid function is important throughout the first and even second and third trimesters. And of course, iodine replacement. Control of diabetes also is very, very important. Even borderline diabetics or hyperglycemia must be controlled. And you can see that when you have optimal glycemic control, you pretty much reduce or eliminate most of the complications that are commonly associated with diabetes, such as biochemical pregnancies, miscarriages, anomalies, macrosomia, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with these things. But these things have to be optimized before you begin stimulating the ovaries for the right oocytes. So you must uh, make a plan for her as to how often she should be monitoring and treating her sugars. High dose folic acid supplementation usually is required. If she has been on metformin for a long time, you must measure and correct her B12 levels. And probably you could reduce the risk of multiple pregnancy by opting for a single embryo transfer if finally she ends up with an IVF cycle. Obesity also can you know, pretty much affect every stage of reproduction. And we know that anovulation or PCOS is associated with obesity, which in turn will cause impaired oocyte and embryo quality, reduced progesterone and luteal phase insufficiencies, impaired embryo implantation, higher miscarriage risk. And even in male partners, obesity can cause a reduced semen quality, increased erectile dysfunction and a reduced libido due to a decline in testosterone levels. We have more and more young couples coming to us where both partners are quite heavy smokers or they often drink alcohol. And this also needs to be corrected so that you get the best quality oocytes. We know that smoking will reduce ovarian reserve, will have cause a lower response to your FSH doses. The patients will have higher levels of markers of oxidative stress in the follicular fluid. You'll get greater number of immature oocytes, increased thickness of the zona, delayed embryo cleavage events and increased risk of embryonic aneuploidy. And so also alcohol is known to cause anovulation, luteal phase defects, lower number of oocytes, abnormal blastosis, lower implantation, increased risk of miscarriage and IUGR, and certain developmental disorders in the fetus. So these are very important points on day one. When you take a detailed history, if you are targeting good oocyte competence, you must make sure that you take care of all these factors. And that brings us to a very debated topic, and that is about oxidative stress and oocyte competence. We have so many products in the market uh, of antioxidants for improving oocyte competence. Remember that stress-induced impairment of oocyte developmental competence is usually because of alterations in the mitochondrial functioning by which causes an increase in the ROS. We know that a disequilibrium between ROS production, which is actually physiological, but if it is excessive, the antioxidative capacity might lead to DNA damage and apoptosis and therefore incorporation of coenzyme Q10 or injection of healthy mitochondria into the oocytes needs to be explored for developing newer and better strategies. 
And that brings us to one of our favorite molecules and that is coenzyme Q. Of course, as always, there is a debate and we had this meta-analysis in 2020, which said that there was low to very low quality evidence to show that taking an antioxidant may benefit subfertile women. And at this time, there is limited evidence in support of supplemental oral antioxidants for subfertile women, but this was for all infertile patients. If you bring it down to patients with a decreased ovarian reserve, that is poor ovarian responders, which almost constitute 40 to 50% of any IVF practice, then we have data and some evidence from a few trials, especially this RCT from 2018, which clearly showed that coenzyme Q treatment for say a couple of months before stimulation, 60 days preceding IVF or IUI, would re resulted in significantly lower requirements of gonadotropin, higher peak E2 levels, lower cancellation rates, increased number of retrieved oocytes, higher fertilization rates, more embryos available for freezing, and more top quality embryos. So there seems to be good evidence now that pretreatment with coenzyme Q10 for Poseidon's group three and maybe four would be useful in improving their outcomes. So also with vitamin D, we have this meta-analysis here shows significantly lower live birth rates in women with vitamin D deficiency compared to women with sufficient level or well supplemented vitamin D. Zinc, even zinc has been shown to improve the meiotic competence of growing oocytes. So it's very important that zinc supplementation either to the patient in some form or during in vitro culture of growing oocytes is beneficial for meiotic competence when subsequently subjected to standard uh, IVF and in vitro maturation. But what really caught my eye is this paper about the use of inositol for improving oocyte competence. Now you would all wonder, oh, that's well-known fact. Yes, we know about it for PCOs and high responders, but what about inositol pretreatment uh, pre for your normal and poor responders? And this paper, this meta-analysis from 2017 showed that oocyte embryo quality and clinical pregnancy rate significantly higher in the myo-inositol supplemented group as compared to the control group. Mind you, these are non-PCOS normal patients. So also the abortion rate was significantly lower in the myo-inositol group. The proportion of top quality embryos was significantly higher with myo-inositol. The proportion of GV or immature oocytes was significantly lower in the supplemented group and the myo-inositol group required less total units of FSH and gonadotropin for achieving an optimal ovarian response. So there seems to be some evidence now with a lot of studies here over the last 10 years showing that inositol supplementation might be useful even for your normal responding patients. Just a few other clinical factors which could affect oocyte and embryo quality before we move on to stimulation. And that is, please remember that don't go overboard with FSH doses. You may feel that she's got a very low AMH and let me give her 300 or 450, but remember that if you go too high, high FSH doses are known to cause slower embryo development. So your aim should always be to get the maximum number of oocytes with the perfect in-between FSH dose and at the same time avoiding any kind of overdosing. We also know that in underweight women, embryo developmental events occur significantly later. So you have delayed cleavage in the uh, zygotes and embryos of underweight women. So that's another important area. We always keep focusing on obesity, but we also need to see the other end of the spectrum. And as I told you earlier, of course, smokers have a significantly later cleavage, but what is important is that in PCOS, you will have prolonged, uh, again, delayed cleavage, and they will have lower number of top quality embryos. So all these are important clinical associated factors which affect embryo competence. Let's move on, of course, to our favorite part where we clinicians really actively get involved besides all the pretreatment, and that is coming down to ovarian stimulation for IUI. Now, remember when you are stimulating the ovaries for a timed intercourse or an IUI, your aim is to just have two, maximum three good quality competent oocytes. You do not want more than that because you don't want high order multiple pregnancies. You also want the cohort to be uniform. You don't want one follicle to be dominant and the other two lagging behind. You want to at the same time have a good endometrium so that you have a perfect pregnancy rate and yet keep it cost effective and safe. Why the magic number of two to three? Even if you look at IVF data, and here you can see data of almost 300,000 IVF cycles, 
which clearly compared that does, is there any correlation between the number of oocytes that you get and oocyte competence. And clearly it was seen that the more the number of oocytes aspirated, the higher were the top quality day two, day three embryos. And you can see here in order to achieve one top quality embryo, you need at least three or more mature oocytes. So you can see here, if you have three mature oocytes, you can expect one top quality embryo. And that is why even for IUI, two to three oocytes would ensure that you at least have one top quality embryo for implantation and give you a reasonable pregnancy rate. Of course, from the IVF perspective, you can see here as there is an increase in the number of oocytes, there is a simultaneous increase in the number of top quality embryos that you can achieve. Now, in order to get those two to three follicles, you first need to decide that what category of patient is this? Is she going to be a high responder? Is she going to be a normal responder? Or is she going to be a poor responder? Because your treatment has now to be individualized and targeted from that angle. So for that, you take into account, of course, the age, the AMH and the AFC, which are our three favorite markers. Of course, you also need to consider BMI, a previous response to treatment, and is there any associated PCO or endometriosis which could affect the response. And once you do that, you would categorize the patient either as a high responder, a normal responder, or a poor responder. Now, remember, you cannot use the same protocols for all three. If you have, want to have a successful timed intercourse or IUI practice, you need to be very specific and targeted as to what is the ideal way to manage the high responder. And of course, there's no debate here that the line of first treatment is your aromatase inhibitors for your PCO and anovulatory patients. Legro showed it in 2013, and we have a lot of uh, evidence thereafter that letrozole is superior to CC as far as PCOs and anovulatory patients are concerned, with a 44% increase in the pregnancy rate as compared to clomiphene citrate. So what are the popular protocols? Of course, letrozole, uh, 5 milligrams from day 2 to 6. If the response is adequate, you could just do a letrozole cycle. But what we normally prefer to do in IUI is to use a sequential protocol, means you back it up with some addition of HMG, usually 75 IU, rarely or sometimes 112 or 150 from day six, and then make sure that you administer HCG when you have two to three lead follicles, which have reached 18 millimeters in mean diameter. So when you do this, not beginning gonadotropins from day two, rather using letrozole from day two to six, you ensure that you recruit just the two and sometimes three follicles and don't end up with too many follicles, even when you add HMG later on from day six or day seven of stimulation. And you can see here, sequential letrozole HMG, superior to clomiphene and HMG for PCOs and anovulatory patients, almost double the clinical pregnancy rate that you would expect which CC and HMG protocols. Also, we know that letrozole, there is a lower incidence of luteinized unruptured follicles, thicker endometrium, and therefore higher pregnancy rates when you compare to CC as this publication from 2015 showed us. What about gonadotropins for the PCOs? And this is where you need to be very careful and you cannot use the conventional protocols of starting with 150 and then trying to step down or any such thing and the protocol of choice is the chronic low dose step up protocol. So you start with just about 50 IU a day, even 37.5 if she's very young and very thin, give it for seven to 14 days, then scan the patient. If you see a response, you continue the same dose. If you don't see a response, you increase the dose by 50% of the original dose. So if it was uh, say around uh, 75, you would like to make it 112.5 and so on. And you keep doing this every seven days till you see the response after which you continue the same dose till you have your lead follicles of a particular diameter when you would like to administer the HCG and do your IUI. There was some criticism that, oh, it's very long and expensive and so on. But with modern day uh, availability of multi-dose vials, pen devices, there is no wastage as before when we had only 75 and 150 available to us. So cost is not really that much of an issue because you can titrate the doses without any wastage and expect a very good response for these patients. If at all you don't want to do such a long follicular phase of stimulation, you could in some PCOs, especially if they're about 30 to 33 with a medium or a very heavy BMI, you could directly start with 112.5 also from day two or day three. And instead of waiting for seven, seven days, 
as this paper shows you can just increase by 37.5 every two to three days until you have a lead follicle now some of us would imagine that this would cause hyperstimulation but if you look at the data from this study four out of ten patients still had just a mono follicular cycle so it seems to be working well for well selected patients excellent clinical pregnancy rate of 30 percent multiple pregnancy rate was surprisingly zero and mild ohss which was just in three out of the 29 patients 10 percent none of them required hospitalization so apparently this is a good compromise and a good in between protocol for a lot of your pco patients when you have to use gonadotropins and letrozole cycles have failed to give you a pregnancy in these patients moving on to the normal responder then remember that here the drug of first choice is clomiphene citrate. So this is the very important part that you need to remember. A lot of us shifted to letrozole for all groups of patients. Remember, it is first choice for anovulatory PCO patients, for unexplained infertility and for regularly cycling patients. Even the latest ASRM guidelines are very clear that clomiphene 100 milligrams, clomiphene citrate remains the first line of treatment for these patients. If it fails, you could then try a cycle of an aromatase inhibitor. If that fails, you can then move on to your sequential protocol where you give clomiphene or letrozole from days two to six and then add HMG 75 to 150. Now here you can go up to 150 because these are normal responders, not going to hyperstimulate. If you then, if this also fails, you can give a direct gonadotropin cycle where you begin with 75 or 112.5 from day two and then entire cycle is run only with gonadotropins and if that fails which most often it will if there is a premature LH surge you then move on to the FSH or HMG cycle with the addition of an antagonist so this is how you progress cycle after cycle but normally patients nowadays don't give us so many chances so ideally I would say one cycle of clomiphene one cycle of clomiphene with HMG and then directly FSH with the antagonist for the third IUI cycle because most of the modern recommendations are to do just three IUIs uh, and then move on to IVF because doing more than three usually is not going to give you a very successful outcome. You're all familiar with clomiphene cited. Of course, 100 is usually the standard starting dose. We do no longer use 50 for any category of patients. 150 very rarely required. And if she ovulates well, then of course the same two to three cycles and so on. What is important here is whether you start on days two, three, four, five, you can expect the same result. More than 150 doesn't improve the ovulation rate. But very importantly, remember that most of the pregnancies that you will achieve with clomiphene will be within the first three cycles. We, of course, know that HCG is usually given at 18 to 19 millimeters. And this paper shows that whether you give it at 18 or 19 or 21 or 22, your pregnancy rates will be the same in clomiphene IUI cycles. Also, we know that as endometrial thickness increases up to say a maximum of 13 or 14 mm, there will be an increase in pregnancy rates. But beyond 14, there might be a drop in the pregnancy rate. So your ideal endometrium should range between say about 7.5 to say about 13.5 if you want the best outcomes. Should you cancel a cycle in clomiphene cycles if the endometrium is too thin? Not really necessary because although clomiphene endometrium will be thinner than FSH and so on, this paper found no evidence or any association between endometrial thickness and final pregnancy rates. And therefore, they recommend that you don't have to cancel the IUI cycle because as you saw in the previous study, even at less than 7 mm, you still have a pregnancy rate even if it is lower than what you get at 11 mm so it's not zero percent even with a thin endometrium when you are a beginner with gonadotropins it's best to use a nomogram so that you don't overdose or underdose and you can see here very easy to do many a times and a lot of studies have shown that most clinicians tend to overdose in their calculations so if you are a beginner please stick to a nomogram such as this very easy to do antral follicle count versus the weight of the patient. For example, you have a patient weighing 65 kilos with an antral follicle count of 15, your ideal starting dose would be 75. Now, if you were to give her 112.5, you would probably end up with eight or 10 follicles with then the eventual event of either having to cancel the cycle or converting her to a last minute IVF, which they won't be very happy about. So please try to use a nomogram so that you don't overdose or underdose a patient who is a potential normal responder and this is the study that clearly showed that in only 15 percent of the cycles did the nomogram calculate a higher starting dose 
So this clearly shows that most of us tend to overdose, which is why we end up with hyperstimulations and high order multiple pregnancies. And applying a nomogram such as this to IUI cycles would lead to a more tailored starting dose of FSH and improve the cost effectiveness of your cycle. Till now, we've always thought that for PCOs and anovulatory patients, you must use pure FSH alone or REC FSH and don't add any LH or give HMG to these patients. We now have a large trial in the form of the Megaset HR, which compared uh, HP HMG versus REC FSH. And you can see here, uh, the blue arm is the HP HMG, black arm is the REC FSH. In of course, IVF patients, this trial showed, but the, what I want to show you is Although the clinical pregnancy rates in the fresh cycles were on par, live birth rates also there was marginally higher with the HPHMG. Of course, it was not lower. So this proved non-inferiority of HPHMG. But what was most important, we all keep struggling with the high pregnancy losses in PCOs and anovulatory patients because of mitochondrial and other defects. And you can see here, there is a significant reduction in early pregnancy losses with the use of HPHMG as compared to REC FSH in PCOs and anovulatory patients. So it's time to reconsider and rethink whether we should be giving a little bit of LH. Uh, it would be interesting now to compare the new Percoveris, that is an FSH-LH combination, a 2 is to 1 ratio with uh, HPHMG and see whether we get the same benefit of a, a reduced early pregnancy loss. And this study clearly showed that with HMG, you would get fewer oocytes. So you get seven fewer oocytes than REC FSH, as this study showed which translated into five fewer metaphase twos, four fewer zygotes, three fewer blastocysts. But when it came to comparing top quality blastocysts, they were the same. So getting seven extra oocytes with REC FSH, which is obviously more potent, doesn't necessarily translate into better outcomes finally. So the number of excellent blastocysts were the same. Also, when we studied the frozen embryo transfer outcomes, again, HPHMG, little bit better than the REC FSH. More importantly, cumulative early pregnancy loss in the frozen cycles was half of the REC FSH arm, despite all these embryos being euploid. They were PGT tested embryos. Now, what does this mean? That means HPHMG and probably the LH or the HCG driven LH activity gives you better mitochondrial oocyte competence in PCOs and anovulatory patients, which is why you have a reduction in the pregnancy losses because most of these losses were not genetically related as we normally associate with miscarriages and were probably because of mitochondrial incompetence, which is very common in PCO subjects. So you can clearly see that giving some form of LH activity helps to improve mitochondrial competence and reduce pregnancy losses. Finally, the poor responders. Now remember, poor responders are just going to give you the two or three follicles which you want but you want all three follicles to be of the same size. So if you get one follicle racing ahead and becoming dominant and the other one or two lagging behind, you don't really achieve much with ovarian stimulation in a poor responder. And that is why pretreatment is so important in the poor responder, some form of pretreatment. Either you give luteal estradiol valerate from day 25 or you use norethisterone or you give the antagonist on days two, three and four any of these three would suffice to make sure that you don't get one dominant follicle, but you get a uniform and synchronous cohort of your two or three follicles for your timed intercourse or the IUI. So it's very important. Either you give luteal estradiol or norethisterone, try to avoid OC pills if you have to use them, not more than 10 days, but the antagonist works really well on days two, three, and four, and then begin your stimulation from day five of the cycle. And how does it help? You can see here this study in poor responders, number of oocytes retrieved increased significantly, statistically significant from 10 to almost 14 with the addition of the antagonist pretreatment. And we know that every additional oocyte that you get will improve your live birth rate in an IVF cycle. The same holds true for your IUI as well, that if you have all three dominant or synchronous follicles, you have a better chance of getting that one top quality embryo as against one dominant follicle, which may or may not give you that one top quality embryo. How high should you go with FSH doses? I always told you, already told you earlier, and there is a lot of evidence to show now that even in IVF, leave alone IUI, uh, going beyond 150, maximum 225 doesn't really help because they don't have that many follicles. If you're just wanting to support a group of two to three follicles, maximum five follicles, 150 IU is more than enough, whether it is IUI or IVF. 
Another very interesting area where we've made a lot of advance over the years is androgen pretreatment in poor respondents. Initially, a lot of us for almost a decade used DHEA in plenty, and that was thanks to Gleischer's initial reports of very good outcomes with two to three months of pretreatment with DHEA. But subsequently, we had three large RCTs which did not demonstrate the same significant benefit with the use of DHEA. And in fact, the current evidence is rather low and does not support its routine use. So then what do we have? And that is where we now have something which is more promising in the form of direct testosterone administered as a transdermal testosterone gel. We know that with advancing age, there is a reduction in androgen levels. We also know a lot of poor responders have reduced testosterone levels, which is not conducive to optimal oocyte competence. You can see here the androgen receptor expression at every stage is very important. Primordial follicle initiation, transition of primary to secondary follicles, preantral follicular development, preantral to antral transition, increasing the antral and preovulatory follicle pop uh, uh, populations, oocyte maturation, all are dependent on the androgen receptor expression and the levels of testosterone locally in the follicular fluids. Now, most of the studies which came to us initially were giving progesterone for 5, 15 or 21 days pre-stimulation and some of them reported better outcomes and so on. But if you actually look at physiology, you can see that the conversion of the secondary to the antral follicle is a duration of 71 days in humans. So giving testosterone for just 5, 15 or 21 days may not be adequate for these patients. Again, you can see that once that Physiologically, you need 60 to 70 days of pre-treatment. Of course, we are worried about side effects and so on with prolonged treatment. And here we had a paper in 2014, which for the first time administered transdermal testosterone for three to four weeks and clearly showed that you have a much better ovarian response and better outcomes in poor responders, also a decrease in the FSH dose, which was required. And in 2017, again, you saw this study which showed greater number of oocytes, better embryos and better pregnancy rates. And in 2019, again, increased live birth rates, increased clinical pregnancy rates. But most of these, as I told you, were with just three to four weeks or just 21 days of transdermal testosterone. We are now awaiting the results of the T-transport trial where they are administering the testosterone gel physiologically for 60 days, that is two months prior to stimulation and then stimulating with the long agonist protocol and HMG, uh, conventional long protocol, and then comparing the outcomes versus a placebo gel. Initial reports seem to be very encouraging that the results with testosterone are in fact better for most of your Poseidon's three and four groups. But until the results are out, we continue to administer and simply put, you just tell her to apply the testosterone gel from day six of the preceding cycle until day two of your actual stimulating cycle. So that is usually a duration of about 20, 21 days. On the topic of androgen then, we also have now more recent evidence that what about using letrozole in poor responders for improving oocyte quality for its property of being an aromatase inhibitor, thereby blocking the conversion of testosterone to estrogen estradiol and thereby increasing the local levels of testosterone around the follicle. And particularly important for patients which are elderly in their late 30s or early 40s in, because it restores the androgenic ovarian environment, which we know significantly deteriorates with female aging. Also, if you extend the letrozole administration to the entire stimulation course, this will prom uh, promote follicular growth, better oocyte competence and quality and endometrial receptivity. And this study, you can see 5 milligram letrozole was given from the first day of stimulation until the trigger day. And this was compared to gonadotropin alone. So you had one group which took only gonadotropins, one group which took gonadotropins and letrozole, and these were all poor or suboptimal responders. And you can see statistically significant reduction in the peak E2 levels, which is expected with the addition of letrozole, and which was beneficial because we know that supraphysiologic estradiol levels are what affect endometrial receptivity in fresh transfer cycles. So if you were to somehow bring down the estradiol and yet get more oocytes and embryos, you could still do fresh embryo transfers and expect the same pregnancy rates as a freeze-all policy. You can see here significantly almost double the number of oocytes, double the number of metaphase 2s, much more number of zygotes, number of top quality embryos, huge difference 
with the addition of letrozole and good clinical pregnancy rates in the range of 30% in this difficult group of poor responder patients. So we now have one more additional kind of treatment besides testosterone, which could help us to restore androgenization and therefore give you better outcomes in poor responders. So to summarize the poor responders, pre-treatment, very important for synchrony and transdermal testosterone or letrozole additions. Initial IUI protocol, of course, clomiphene or letrozole with HMG sequential. Move on to high dose FSH or HMG. Again, 150 usually suffices, maximum 225 for an obese patient. And always preferable to add the antagonist because if you are spending so much money on gonadotropins, you don't want a premature LH surge to go and ruin your outcome. And that is what brings us to what is common to all the three groups, and that is whether you should use antagonist with the gonadotropins, what should be your trigger, and what should be your luteal phase support. And you can see here, classical balance study that when you use gonadotropins alone, one in four, that is 24 to 25% of patients will have a premature LH surge, which will disturb and ruin the outcome of that cycle. So it's always best to add an antagonist around day five or day six of stimulation when your lead follicle is about 14 millimeters in mean diameter and continue it until the day of HCG. And clearly you can see here a doubling of the pregnancy rate as compared to gonadotropin alone from 11 up to 22%. Even this study from France 2016 clearly showed that one significant difference in practice that had a very important impact on the final outcome was the use of the antagonist. And they clearly showed much higher pregnancy rates with as compared to without addition of the antagonist. And again, more recent evidence from 2019, even in PCO patients, when you add antagonist to your FSH, you completely eliminate the premature LH surge and you greatly increase the clinical pregnancy rates in those patients. So that brings us to then, which is best for optimizing your oocyte quality? Is it the agonist or the antagonist? These are just a few slides to show you that in poor responders, you could still use one cycle of the long down regulation agonist with HMG, even for your IUI, because you know you will not get hyperstimulation. And we know purely because this is to give you a perfectly synchronized follicular development and higher number of oocytes, which is important in poor responder patients. Is there any additional benefit? And we have this paper from 2009, which clearly shows that with the agonist, you have a greater number of oocytes. You have fewer oocytes with cytoplasmic abnormalities. And this is very, very important. Also, you have more fertilized oocytes available. You have more uh, zygotes with normal pronuclear morphology and a tendency to higher pregnancy rates. It's all these subtle advantages which are very important in poor responders for a better outcome. And our own study here, you can see in the same patient, we compared antagonist versus agonist. And you can clearly see greater number of oocytes, but more importantly, greater number of top quality embryos with the agonist as compared to the antagonist in Poseidon's three and four and poor responders. Uh, <clears throat> what about the trigger? And here we know that HCG, whenever in clomiphene cycles, we normally can administer between 17 to 21 at any size. Gonadotropins, we like to give it at 18 to 19 millimeters mean diameter. Ovulation will usually occur at 38 or to 40 hours post HCG trigger. And therefore, the best time of insemination appears to be around 42 hours, which is the time when you can see you have the highest clinical pregnancy rates as compared to lesser or longer durations from the HCG time. What about giving the agonist trigger? In IVF, we know that the agonist trigger will give you a deficient luteal phase, so we promote freeze-all. But here is an interesting study in IUI where they showed no statistically significant difference in pregnancy rates, although I feel 13 is much lower than 23%. But the, another paper specifically said that this advantage of the agonist trigger in an IUI cycle is in patients who have a follicular endometrial asynchrony. And this especially occurs in clomiphene cycles. A lot of the time you find that the follicle has become 20 mm, but the endometrium is still just 6.5 or 7 mm. And here they say that if you give the agonist trigger, because it induces a surge of both FSH and LH, unlike HCG, which only simulates LH, you get higher pregnancy rates, higher live birth rates, and significantly lower miscarriage rates in this particular group of patients who have follicular endometrial asynchrony. Also, many a times you have more follicles, you get less oocytes, you have more oocytes, you have less metaphase twos. And here again, that brings us to, okay, what about giving both the HCG and the agonist trigger? And why, 
as I told you earlier, because the agonist trigger induces a more physiological peak by giving you both LH and FSH surges. So you can see when you add, give a dual trigger, you have significantly higher number of two sites and metaphase twos, especially in patients who are not giving you enough two sites as compared to the number of stimulated follicles. And also in patients where you don't get enough metaphase two sites, the dual trigger helps to rectify this part. And in poor responders, again, you can see this study, when you give a combination trigger, you have much better outcomes as compared to giving just HCG in patients with a diminished ovarian reserve. We now have evidence from last year that even in normal responders, a dual trigger will give you a higher number of top quality embryos as compared to HCG alone or the agonist alone. So dual trigger is definitely a huge role to play, especially for poor responders in giving you optimal outcomes. And finally, of course, luteal phase support. We know clomiphene alone cycles may not need luteal phase support, but wherever you have used goratotropins, you have to give support. Whether you use vaginal progesterone in the form of gel or capsules, the results and outcomes are the same. But if you don't use luteal phase support, you have significantly lower pregnancy rates uh, and therefore, luteal phase support is mandatory in gonadotropin cycles. We also now have an option in the form of oral didrogestron. Uh, 30 milligrams uh, in divided doses usually is adequate for any cycle which has a functioning corpus luteum. And maybe you don't need to give MVP anymore. How many cycles should you be doing? We now have evidence that in couples with an indication for IUI, at least three consecutive IUI cycles should be performed. How do you prevent multiple pregnancies in IUI? Remember, try to keep your gonadotropin doses to less than or equal to 75. Don't go above 87.5 or max 112.5. IUI should be withheld when you have more than two or three follicles or you have more than five follicles at the time of HCG. Try to always incorporate clomiphenol, letrozole, or tamoxifen for the first five days so that you don't get more than two or three follicles. So summarizing then, poor responders, coenzyme Q, DHEA or testosterone pretreatment, hormonal pretreatment with the estradiol or norethisterone or the antagonist for synchrony, starting doses of around 150. You can safely use the agonist or the antagonist because you will not get hyperstimulation in these patients. Normal responders try to use a nomogram so you don't go wrong with your starting dose and don't end up with OHSS. 75 to 150 as per the nomogram. Try to add the antagonist in a gonadotropin only cycle so that you don't get a premature LH surge. And in high responders, always prefer the chronic low dose step up, starting doses of 37.5 to 75, and expect a few multiple pregnancies when you use gonadotropins in high responders. Now, all these fine, fine tunings for each category are so that you get the most competent oocytes and get the best outcomes. So, of course, I've already said most of this earlier that maybe gonadotropin alone is better than clomiphen, letrozole, letrozole is better than clomiphen and so on. But mainly you need to remember that three to four cycles are enough before resorting to ICSI or IVF because IVF has a sevenfold higher likelihood of pregnancy as compared to IUI. So with that, we come to the end of this presentation. Once again, I'm really grateful to Dr. Sunil Jindal, my distinguished co-speaker for putting together this program with Dr. Sonal. And of course, Lay, uh, uh, Mr. Pratap and everybody of the INTAS uh, EVA division who has helped us uh, to come together today. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for giving a very practical and insightful lecture. Uh, and uh, practically, uh, they must have learned and uh, many queries have been solved already in your lecture. Uh, there are a few questions uh, which I might take uh, with your permission, sir. Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, in which way CC better than letrozole in normal responder because the anti-estrogen effect of CC is there for all? Yeah, it is. But uh, all the available evidence as of now for unexplained infertility because the ASRM guidelines from 2020, which have taken into account huge number of studies for, uh, comparing all the various molecules. And they have very clearly shown that there is very strong evidence in favor of clomiphene citrate as first line treatment for unexplained infertility patients. We are not talking of PCOs and other categories. So there is evidence now to show that the exact mechanism of action, we don't know, but it is superior as far as ongoing pregnancy rates are concerned. Thanks. Uh, next question is, in normal responder, uh, should we start with 75 or 150? 
uh, better to use a nomogram but usually if she's a normal under 35 endocrinologically normal uh, female then it's best to start with 75 or 112.5 and try to avoid 150 so that you don't get recruitment of too many follicles after five days of 75 if you see two or three dominant follicles you can continue the same or step up a little bit if you feel the need but most of the time 75 87.5 or 112.5 usually suffices to give you your two or three follicles for iui Right, sir. And uh, in chronic low dose, uh, should we step up after seven days or uh, fourteen days? Can so we? Can we? With... Sorry, please complete. Please uh, can can we start after uh, uh, increase after seven days? Yeah. So if you are starting with thirty-seven point five or fifty, you need to wait for fourteen days because that's the minimum time it takes for the priming and to exceed the FSH threshold for recruitment of the dominant follicle. But if you are starting with a higher dose, say seventy-five or eighty-seven point five. then you have to assess within a week because there is a higher chance that you will have recruited the follicle so also if you saw the protocol where i showed directly starting yeah. with 112.5 they said that you have to start scanning every 3 or 4 days not even wait for the 7 days so depends on what starting dose you have used that would be the duration of observation time that is required to wait and the uh, patient if the patient is affording and uh, well to do can, can should we go for uh, recombinant fsh in a uh, normal re responder and uh, uh, will it give more um, beneficial effect in uh, iui also no so there is a huge meta analysis now that whether you use urinary you use recombinant you use hphmg whichever preparation you use your pregnancy rates are the same and the cochrane meta analysis is very clear that we don't need any more studies and we don't need any more evidence there is enough of evidence now that they are all equal but if you uh, prefer to use the danger with rec fsh in a iui cycle is that because it is more potent you will have a higher recruitment of follicles like i showed you in the megaset trial even in ivf you get seven more oocytes with rec fsh so in iui instead of your three if you end up with five or seven you might have to convert her to an ivf or cancel the iui so whether she is affording or not it wouldn't be wise unless you are starting with a very low dose like if you were to give that patient say 75 of hmg you could start with 50 of rec fsh if you have to use rec fsh and hope for a, a similar response so 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 in uh, iui if we are using a, a rec fsh it should be a lower dose compared a to more hmg than what you would have normally given her with normally it. given to hmg uh, and 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 uh, sir one question is uh, you said about coenzyme q10 uh, for uh, pre treatment so what dosage and what duration do you recommend uh, before iui so normally we require uh, like to give a combination of uh, ubq with resveratrol so that we give that is 100 plus uh, resveratrol 40 for about 2 months at least 60 days pre treatment a uh, pre art cycle right sir and zinc also zinc also you have yeah you can it. give her a zinc with a multivitamin zincovito any of the available okay. preparations and that two uh, two or three months yeah you know it all yes. we have started giving all pcos uh, this paper we have just come across now so we are thinking of using it for normal responders as well right sir and uh, sir we also discuss about the use of testosterone gel in even in uh, maybe in iui so uh, in poor responders or poor ovary reserve patients so um, how do we um, treat uh, for what uh, duration and so i showed that slide you can start from day 5 or day 6 of the previous cycle until right, day 2 when you start your stimulation in the iui cycle so that would be about 20 days if she has a 27 28 day cycle correct sir so uh, with this sir there are many questions but uh, we'll have the next session uh, thank you very much for giving so much uh, this uh, practical insightful lecture to all our viewers uh, on you. behalf of any does i thank you thank you thank, sir, thank you. you so much thank you so much for your uh, valuable time sir because nowadays giving a time for this session and our audience are very much happy and i am happy to inform you that currently 1538 oh <laughs> audience are live i am talking about oh. live sir registration is more wow. than that the people oh, who good. are on live are 1538 so thank you so much and thank you uh, for your valuable time. organization thank you, so yeah, thank you thank you so much sir madam uh, can we go for the next session Yes, sir. Yeah, Vinod. Uh, uh, with this, I welcome uh, Dr. Sunil Jindal, sir, for uh, the next session that is uh, optimizing uh, OA, sorry, sperm in natural pregnancy and IUI. Uh, over to you, sir, Dr. Sunil Jindal, sir.
thank you very much thank you very much sonal ji thank you very much dr jatin shah i love it because you make the most complicated thing into chocolates and you present chocolates to everybody and that's why people love it but first of all let me also thank the audience over here because let me be honest a saturday evening could be used for anything else but you decided to be over here so from the bottom of my heart i'm thankful to you and i hope by the end of the session there would be something amazing delivered to you which you could use for your patients so today i'm going to bring in three secrets three secrets because it's interesting first of all how to optimize sperm medically second would be how to optimize sperm surgically and the third how to optimize sperm in the laboratory and it's interesting because i'll just share something with you about myself uh it was the summer of 1992 i had just become a senior resident or a registrar as it was called in mulazar medical college and in our college we had an amazing urologist who used to do andrology we had we didn't have a separate urology department it was with general surgery and it was professor kaza so professor kaza used to be doing vea vvas microsurgery so one afternoon it was very warm i remember it was still july i was assisting him and he was going on under a microscope the job of an assistant in microsurgery if he's watching through the other lens is extremely tedious and after 2 hours he said jindal i've got a sperm and you know it was so it was so sudden it came out of my mouth so but what are you going to do with this sperm because there was no exe so i still remember that day and in 2004 when we started doing exe the dots got connected and these sperms were used for the work which we do today and incidentally uh, i developed also love for the laboratory because i did 6 months of housemanship in pathology clinical pathology so ultimately all the dots got together and andrology is a new science not many people take care of men everybody thinks woman is the person to be looked after but men need care too and i have this amazing presentation for you today and i'd like you to be there for me at this moment and i'll just start the presentation so i'll begin with the presentation and the first thing which all of us need to understand is the difference between idiopathic and unexplained and this is of prime importance because in male fertility this holds a lot of value so idiopathic is when men presented with no obvious history of fertility problems are both physical on physical examination and endocrine laboratory testing are normal however the semen analysis as routinely performed reveals abnormalities that come alone or in combination but unexplained is when the semen analysis as routinely performed shows no abnormality so first of all any male who has developed infertility or who has developed impotence is associated with an impaired overall health in fact i always say that the best barometer for a man's health is the quality of his sperm and the quality of his erection and it also signifies a decreased life expectancy and a lower quality of life number one the second thing is the reduced fecundability the longer time it takes for pregnancy now let's understand that the relevance is that even if it is done normally without art there is a longer time to pregnancy there is a recurrent pregnancy loss and also there is a negative outcome in iui in art if the sperm is not optimized and there is also a transfer of genetic defect in art so this is the clinical relevance whenever this question is asked so let's go on further that the eau guidelines as well as the new aua asrm guidelines which have just come up in 2021 they both say two things which are common number one investigate both partners together examine all men for a fertility problem and if the semen analysis is negative it is best that the man should be evaluated 
by somebody like a urologist, andrologist, or anybody who could specially examine and treat the male. And in couples with failed ART or recurrent pregnancy losses, even a greater evaluation of the male is needed. In fact, the WHO, to, um, I would say semen analysis, which is coming up now, it also has brought in sperm function tests as an indication in a semen abnormal sample. So what are the goals of main infertility workup? Goals are very simple. Diagnosis is to be done for potentially correctable conditions and for irreversible conditions suitable for ART. ART using own sperm. The counseling needs to be done very deeply in which sperm cannot be available and donation and adoption are the only options. And the treatment guidance leads also for us to understand that associated with it, there are other medical conditions which need to be looked into and genetic abnormalities and lifestyle is something which needs to be counseled and guidance needs to be given in this. So let's go on to the standardization. It's very standard. A clinical history is taken. Physical examination is done. Two semen analysis minimum are done. You go do the, but after the semen analysis has been done, there could be an indication for a sperm function test, endocrine evaluation, additional testing as genetic evaluation, transrectal ultrasound, MRI, retrograde ejaculation, testicular biopsy, vasography. But all these are there once the semen analysis has been done. Endocrine evaluation, well, if there is a low testosterone, less than 300 nanograms per deciliter or less than 10.4 nanomoles per liter, do a repeat testosterone, measure free if you possibly can, test the LH, estradiol, prolactin, and thyroid hormones. What could it be? It could be either hypogonadism. Hypogonadism could be testicular or pretesticular. There could be hyperprolactinemia because of which the testosterone could be down, or there could be hypothyroidism. Do the FSH. If the FSH is low, there can be three things. Hypo, hypo, the patient is on SCG therapy, or the patient is on testosterone replacement therapy. If the FSH is normal, great. If the FSH is high, it is spermatogenic dysfunction. Now the genetic testing, well, it would be the purview of the next lecture, but I've just brought in this slide to give you one beautiful aspect. And that is that the frequency of chromosomal abnormalities increases when the sperm count goes down. And the abnormality in an azoospermic would be 10%, in zero to 19 would be 5%, more than 19 it's going to be 1%. This is of extreme importance in an andrological evaluation. Genetic testing, most common to be done would be a G-band karyotyping and a Y chromosome microdeletion. Now, one, this slide is very important for us to understand that spermatogenesis is regulated primarily by FSH and LH-driven testosterone. So what happens is, that the LH, which would be coming from the pituitary gland, it would be acting on the Leydig cells, and this would be increasing the intratesticular testosterone. Only when the intratesticular testosterone is adequate, would FSH be able to properly bring about spermatogenesis in the seminiferous tubules. So the pharmacotherapy, now I'm talking about medicines and optimizing sperm, I have just put them into a particular category, antibiotics, gonadotrophins, aromatase inhibitors, selective estrogen receptor modulators, dopamine agonists, antioxidants, thyroid hormones, antithyroid medication. This is what I would bring in as a standard. So the first of all, I'll come to antibiotics. Whenever there is infection, antibiotics are started. Patients with confirmed or suspected bacterial infection should be treated with broad spectrum antibiotics. Antibiotics either are quinolone, tetracyclines, or microlytes. They need to be taken for as much or as many as six weeks in a full dose. You need to understand over here, though it's a total topic altogether, you need to see whether the infection is in the prostate, the infection is in the seminal vesicle, the infection is in the epididymis, or it's a generalized infection. The duration and the type of treatment is going to be relevant depending on where the infection is present. It's very difficult to remove this infection because in this infection, normally the blood testicular barrier 
does not allow the antibiotic to reach the right place. Antibiotic treatment may improve sperm quality, but it does not necessarily improve the probability of increasing conception. That's literature till now. Data is insufficient to conclude whether antioxidant treatment along with in infertile men with leukocytospermia may improve fertility outcomes. Always refer the sexual partners of the patient with accessory sex gland infections that are known or suspected to be caused by sexually transmitted disease for evaluation and treatment. Now, when it comes to treatment, individualizing with gonadotrophins, beautiful. I still can never forget, I always repeat it, but you know, this is magic. A lady I had known who was extremely rich, she came to me, this is about 12 years back. She came to me and said, where can I buy the most expensive sperm? And I looked at her because I really wondered why she asking me and what kind of a question it is. So I looked at her and said, what's the problem? She showed me some reports and there were reports of hypogonotrophic hypogonotism diagnosed at the age of 16 years untreated. So I looked at her, this was about 14 years, I think, back. And I said, I think, I do not know whether it's the most expensive, but the best sperm will be if these testicles could make a sperm. So we started him on HCG and added HMG. And I can never forget four months after that, I get a call from the lab. Sir, in me to sperm agai. And we finally did an ICSI because the sperm count was low. First time she didn't get pregnant. Second time we transferred three embryos. She had triplets, did a fetal reduction. And finally, finally, she had beautiful twins. From that time onwards, we've had a very large series of hypohypos. And the treatment regimen would be, you have to first of all categorize whether it's congenital or adult onset. If it is congenital, you start the person on SG 2,500 to 5,000 international units biweekly. You'll also start HMG. We start HMG, the recombinant FSH can be given. HMG is cheaper. 150 international units biweekly for six to 12 months. In adult onset, you would go SCG 1,000 to 5,000 international units biweekly alone for the first three months. Then you will add SCG recombinant 75 to 225, depending on the weight for three to 12 months. You would like to see the sperm in the ejaculate, but the sperm comes in the ejaculate. They could have natural IUI or an ART pregnancy. You would like to get done the FSH testosterone on E2 monthly. You'll do a physical examination every month. You've got to judge the testicular size because once you start giving them HCG and the testosterone X, the testicular size improves and do a semen analysis monthly after three months. Most important slide, please do not give any person who is infertile any kind of testosterone, whether it is oral, injectable, transdermal. The reason is simple. It increases in the blood, strikes off the LH, LH becomes down, there is no LH in the testicle, the intratesticular testosterone falls, and the person becomes either oligospermic or azospermic. This is what happens in the gyms most of the times, but the problem is there's so many physicians who write testosterone for oligospermia and sexual debility that ultimately you get so many patients who've taken this. FSH therapy in idiopathic male fertility is something which has come up phenomenally. There are these RCTs which are there starting from 2003 till a recent one, which I've not been able to include over here. All these, all these papers show that in case you give a recombinant FSH, these papers are with recombinant FSH, but you can also give HMG to them versus a placebo on sperm concentration. There has been an enhancement and there is a significantly higher pregnancy rate for patients receiving recombinant FSH. Aromatase inhibitors are to be used in two conditions where the testosterone is down and where the TE ratio is less than 10. Whenever a man comes to me who's very fat, I always get his testosterone and estradiol done. If the ratio is less than 10, I normally put them onto letrozole 2.5 milligrams twice a day. And I would continue this throughout for about three months. I would be monitoring over here the testosterone and the estradiol. I'm going to ask him to lose weight. 
Most of these people, if they lose weight and they take this, the testosterone improves, the sperm count improves, the sperm quality improves. However, there are no RCTs available to now, and the EUA guideline says that no conclusive recommendation can be drawn due to the quality of these studies. But remember one small thing, this is a beautiful drug in only a particular subset. Selective estrogen receptor modulators, clomiphen, 25 milligram given regularly is given so much. Why is it given? Because it blocks the estrogen receptors at the hypothalamus level, which results in stimulation of GnRH secretion, leading to increased pituitary uh, gonadotropin release and increases spermatogenesis. 2019 meta-analysis, 16 studies shows an increased sperm count, testosterone, and pregnancy rate. However, the quality of the papers is down. According to the guidelines, it may be governed, but there is no conclusive recommendation which can be drawn because of the poor quality available today of the papers which are available. But I normally give my patients clomiphen citrate 25 milligram whenever I find that the testosterone is low normal or at the lower end of the normal range. Dopamine agonist, a beautiful drug. If you do a prolactin of the patient, the prolactin is high. Incidentally, the testosterone is going to be down. These patients normally will have a lot of impotence. If the serum testosterone uh, prolactin level is less than 25 microgram per liter, put them onto cabergolin twice a week. It is associated with an increase in testosterone and a better <clears throat> semen quality. Now, in idiopathic male infertility empirical treatment, is selective estrogen receptors, aromatase inhibitors, gonadotrophins, but something amazing I'm going to tell you is, and that is antioxidants. It's very surprising that till about a couple of years back, about seven to eight, 10 years back, I never realized myself that what magic antioxidants could do. And I'll tell you the magic from what I've experienced. So this is a Cochrane review from the Cochrane database 2011, the live birth rates and pregnancy rates, whenever oral antioxidants were given for male infertility was present, especially in subfertile people. But this is a beautiful paper. I'll tell you this original article needs to be read. And this global survey of reproductive specialists to determine the clinical utility of oxidative stress testing and antioxidant use in male infertility has been one of the largest ever. And this survey was to see what percentage of people all over the world use it? So the percentage of people who use it are those who are really hardcore practicing andrologists, urologists, infertility specialists, gynecologists. And the reason that it has been used is because of the environmental lifestyle factors as drugs, smoking pollution, which we all know is phenomenal, systemic pathologies, which we know diabetes, cancer, systemic infections, and very importantly, male accessory gland infections, sexually transmitted diseases, prolonged status of stasis of the spermatozoa in epididymis, and immature or abnormal spermatozoa. All these things lead to oxidative stress. Sperm is very sensitive. The sperm has no cytoplasm. It is tightly packed DNA in a head, and it's racing against time. And unfortunately, it takes oxidative stress very fast, leads to spermatozoal dysfunction and infertility, and therefore the evaluation of oxidative stress becomes very important. This is a beautiful collection of all the papers of which are the drugs where all do they work. Vitamin C, vitamin E, ferritin, carnitine, coenzyme Q, transferrin, zinc, selenium, and acetyl L-cysteine, arginine, folic acid. It's a whole review of papers which are available. Now, how do you use, where do you use? Something to understand is if there is a varicocele, genital infection, smoking, medication, drug abuse, systemic disease, pollution, radiation, idiopathic, male infertility with it, testing of leukocytes comes positive. These are the subset which may have be helped by antioxidants. This is, I mean, this paper, I'm, I'll, I'll get your emails. I've got to send you a couple of papers for everybody to read. This is one of the most amazing papers, which is a systemic review. And this systemic review doesn't only speak about the types and doses of male infertility. 
It also talks about the benefits of semen parameters on DNA fragmentation, assisted reproduction, and live birth rates. And today, the doses which have been in all these systemic reviews which have come out are vitamin C 500 milligram, vitamin E 400 milligram, folic acid, zinc, selenium, two milligram, 25 milligram, 26 microgram, and acetyl cysteine, 600 milligram, coenzyme Q 100 to 300, lycopene 2.5 to 5, L-carnitine 1000. But one thing to understand, this will not work if it is in a lesser dose. It will not work if it is not given for a minimum two months, three months, or four months. And these are something which in case there is leukocytospermia with the antibiotic, though it has not been proven till now in a lot of papers, are, I would say, additive. So antioxidants, once again, what I'm speaking about, oxidative stress plays a major role. And 30 to 80% of infertile men have elevated seminal ROS, because of which it is it affects sperm function, the plasma membrane, acrosome, motility, lipid peroxidation takes place, and even the chromatin leading to sperm DNA fragmentation. Well, they have been associated very closely by the pregnancy outcomes, both in natural and ART, and a healthy offspring. Uh, I'll tell you something very interesting about this particular patient of mine. And I say this because I've experienced this. There was complete asinospermia in the sample and uh, did a host test. There was no viability and uh, diagnosed as necrospermia. So I called him to my clinic and I told him that, well, we've not been able to see even a single live sperm. And I think you should go in for a donation. He looked at me and said, is there anything which can be done? I really did not, <laughs> did not know what to do. So put him on to antioxidants. And we put him on to on antioxidants. Four months after giving him antioxidants, we ran his semen again. And we found a few viable sperms. Didn't exceed. And finally, the man has a baby. It's just one case I'm talking about, but the experience which I have is something which I want to share with you. Because I personally feel after this, I became very much inclined towards antioxidant therapy. So for medical treatment, the conclusion would be 15% of men are going to benefit. Potential candidates include men with. MAGI, endocrine, and idiopathic infertility. You could give them antibiotics, gorontrophin treatment may help. SERMs, AI, antioxidants, well, they all can be used in idiopathic. At the moment, the data and the quality is poor. It would need some recommendations, but in the future, I'm sure it's going to brighten us for all of us. So now optimizing spur in the laboratory. So it's interesting because the lab is a place where incidentally also I have interest. So optimizing in the laboratory is very important because the semen analysis looks simple, but is phenomenally complex. And the problem with the semen analysis is it is not a plus and minus. All that it is, is a percentile of people who have been able to get their partner pregnant within one year. So for any test, to be considered predictive, you need that it could be replicated accurately. This test can be replicated accurately, but nobody does it. There needs an optimal threshold value with sufficient discriminatory values, which must be determined by looking at test characteristics and optimizing sensitivity and specificity using receiver operator characteristic curves in high purity. It means, that whenever this test needs to be done, it needs to be done correctly and the operator needs to be trained and the operator himself needs to be judged for the quality of the work he's doing over a period of time. And the most important thing is that apart from the robustness and reproducibility of the test, there has to be a very high ability to classify the expected outcome beforehand on the basis of the obtained results. But you know, a semen analysis doesn't 
come over here because this is a percentile. And it's a percentile of men who have been able to have a pregnancy within one year. And this is what the WHO has come up with as a percentile. So the importance to understand is that you need to understand the fifth percentile as well as the 50th percentile. And if you understand the 50th and the fifth percentile, you would be, you will get a better understanding of the report of what actually the man has and what do you need to do for him. So the reason there have been two problems with this. One problem has been, it's not standardized till now. By standardized, I mean people do not follow it. And the second is adoption of the strict criteria for morphology, which is not done properly. And in this case, only a single specimen was taken, not two specimens were taken. The population studied was not the Asian population. So semen analysis still remains the cornerstone and it can provide you data which will predict, not predict, but make you wiser of what probably you need to do. The strict morphology, you know, there's a lot of questions which are asked from me. How come earlier the uh, semen morphology was higher and now it's 4%? It's 4% because now strict criteria which evaluates every sperm, you have to count at least 200 sperms on an oculometer, see what is the size, and then say these are the slides which are normal. However, the best thing is that sperm morphology, even in ART, is not the greatest predictor of pregnancy. So leukocytospermia I'd like to talk about. If you have more than 10 past cells per high power field, you need to understand that it's a marker of reproductive tract inflammation. It could lead to lipid membrane, <coughs> membrane lipid peroxidation, can also lead to DNA damage, ROS production, is 100 times higher than round cells. You need to diagnose the difference between round cells and leukocytes. And the reason is you can confuse. So you need to do a peroxidase test, which is a very simple test to done. Now, where all do you need a microbiological culture? So the indications of microbiological culture are hypospermia, decreased pH, hemospermia, alteration in liquefaction, more than one, uh, more than 10 per high power field, marked asthenospermia, marked allugospermia, spontaneous agglutination of spermatozoa in the ejaculate, teratozoospermia, a decrease in prostatic markers, acid phosphatase and citric acid of the seminal vesicles, a background of urogenital infections, and inclusion into a donation program. So it is very important to do a culture. In fact, the beauty is cultures come as negative and they come as negative because of the anterior bacteri antibacterial property of seminal zinc. So because of the seminal zinc, a lot of cultures where infection is present come as negative. So the next is the newer test. I'm just talking about the functionality. You may have any number of sperms, but if they're not functional, babies would not be born. The functionality of these sperms is important. And if you look at the functionality of these sperms, I'll only talk about three tests at the moment, sperm DNA integrity, reactive oxygen species, and y chromosome microdeletion screening. This I would talk in the next one, these two over here. And I'd like to really bring out a clarity in sperm DNA fragmentation. Sperm DNA fragmentation, a review article was written. I was again fortunate to be with Dr. Ashok Agarwal on this. And the background is that normal sperm chromatin is essential for paternal genetic transmission. Unexplained infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, poor outcomes could be present. The principle is quantification of sperm DNA strand. You could use a lot of techniques to find out, but the summary is that testing could be done by any of them, including HALO test. Cutoff is different for different laboratories. A lot of laboratories who use tunnel test use about 20% to be used, where they use about 20% as the cutoff but the cutoffs are between 20 and 35%. Testing should be done two to five days with two to five days of ejaculatory abstinence, but most important, it has to be either done fresh or you need a thought sample. So if any laboratory which you're sending to outside the city, you've got to freeze the sample and send it so that they may thaw and do it immediately. 
this is a very important thing because most of the laboratories who come to you and when I talk to them and I ask them that you say you're going to take DNA samples, how will you take DNA fragmentation samples? They say on carbon dioxide. You need to know it's got to be a frozen sample and we've got to thaw it. Now, the next thing is what are the indications? It's very important that the indications have improved and increased phenomenally. It could be unexplained or idiopathic male infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, clinical varicose, lifestyle factors, before or after failure of IUI, IVF, ICSI. A lot of people ask me, why not do it? Why should we do it after a failure? I always say you can do it before. Recurrent pregnancy loss after ICSI, sperm freezing, Management is lifestyle advice and modification, use of antioxidants, recurrent ejaculation, treatment of underlying condition like varicocele, antibiotics, and use of ICSI if sperm DNA fragmentation persists, is persistently elevated. If ICSI fails with these people, you will have to use another method for sperm selection after failed ICSI, testicular sperm if ICSI fails. This is in a nutshell of the way it's going to be. This is a whole guideline, an algorithm which is beautiful, which I'll send to you. Uh, this is a beautiful slide which I've taken from Sandro. And uh, in this slide, he so simply brings out that in case there's a high DNA fragmentation, the IOI results, which would normally be 19%, would decrease to about 1.5%. And pregnancy by the method of IVF is 26%, but about 42% by ICSI. Why? because the cytoplasm of the woman repairs the male DNA. So women don't only really take care of men <clears throat> at home, in the kitchen, but also in the cytoplasm. And the younger the woman, the better the cytoplasm, the more the chances of the DNA correction. Well, you could use a halo test in your laboratory. Once you learn it, it's a beautiful test to do. And this has been standardized now. Now, how can you optimize sperm preparation and minimize DNA fragmentation? Abstinence period may not be too long. Time between ejaculation and sample preparation needs to be fast. Viscous semen samples need to be liquefied. Centrifugation time needs to be less. Storage and temperature is important and should not be varying too much. Simple sperm washing should be not be done for an IUI because the ROS production is very high and the presence of large non-viable spermatozoa in the prepared sample can inhibit capacitation. You have two methods of doing it. Number one is the direct swim-up technique and the other is the density gradient. Direct swim-up technique is normally done where the semen quantity is good. And the beauty about them is, I won't go into the details of this, but I'll just show you. In sperm washing, previously you have this, and once, The video is not running too well. This is the way it's going to appear. <clears throat> Just a minute, I think. I... So density gradient could be used. Now, I'll just bring in this slide for comparison because there is so much to talk about and so little time. If you do a simple cash, the time taken is less, the cost is low, the yield is high, but the quality is very low. If you do a direct swim up, the time is the maximum, the cost is low, the yield is less, but in a good sample, it's enough, and the quality is the highest. In the density gradient, the time taken would be high, the cost would be highest, yield would be highest and the quality would be high. So normally you would use a direct swim up in a normal zoo spermic. And while a double density gradient you would use in oligospermic, teratozoospermic, or asthenospermic. But most of the large reviews show that the pregnancy rates of both are the same in an IUI. Uh, there are a lot of other tests which normally you would like to do, hypoosmotic swelling test, sperm cervical mucus test, which was done earlier, anti-sperm antibody test, not done too much now. However, assessment of the reactive oxygen species, DNA fragmentation are something which are 
there and they would become mainstay in the future. Uh, very interesting patient, very high DNA fragmentation and uh, oligospermic, did ICSI with the oligospermic sample, uh, got embryos, not very good. Next time did a TISA sample, took out those DC sperms and had two babies. Not that I would at the moment say that the testicular sperm is too good, but I would just say that, well, in case of very high DNA fragmentation, if these patients have failed, you could try a testicular sperm. Now, optimizing sperm surgically, I'd like to clarify one small thing with everybody about varicocele, because I operate varicoceles day in and day out. 15% of all men, including adolescents, have varicoceles. Prevalence in primary infertility is 35 to 44%. Prevalence in secondary is 45 to 91%. It is the most correctable cause of male infertility. I'm talking of guidelines. 2021 guidelines say a palpable varicocele with infertility, abnormal semen parameters except for azospermic men indicate a varicocelectomy. Additional indications could be testicular asymmetry, pain, hypogonadism, elevated sperm DNA fragmentation, IVF failures, and in a few, it could be cosmesis. Robust data, it's phenomenal data, which I cannot show at the moment because there is a paucity of time. It demonstrates that it leads to increased sperm concentration, increased sperm motility, increased sperm morphology, decreased DNA fragmentation, increased serum testosterone. These are, I've just put in about five papers over here which show that sperm DNA fragmentation testing shows that with varicocele, there is a decrease in STF in nearly all these patients, but it does not improve when done in subclinical varicoceles. Therefore, there is no indication of surgery in a subclinical varicocele. It is only to be done in a palpable varicocele. Two things to be understood in varicocele surgery. You've got to do a microsurgical varicocelectomy, either inguinal or subinguinal. I use a microvascular Doppler, and this is the reason you can save the spermatic artery as well as the lymphatics, because of which you do not have testicular damage and the sperm count improves. And moreover, if you cut off all the lymphatics, the chances of having hydrocele are high. I've tried to rush in because there was so much to say, but I've tried to simplify it to the fullest. I don't think I could have done a better job of simplifying all the literature and the work which I do. But one quote of Phil Jackson says it all. The most we can hope for is to create the best possible conditions for success. Then let go of the outcome. The ride is a lot more fun that way. And I'll thank you for that. And thank you very much, Intas. Thank you, Dr. Jatin, for accepting the invitation and making this program even so much more, I would say, exciting and, of course, glamorous. And you really simplify things to a level which I have realized make things so beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your, uh, you know, I can say that it's a detailed uh, insight given to our audience and the response which I see in the, our Q&A box it was a awesome, great, it's a great insight, such kind of feedback I received in my QA support. And uh, I'd like to thank on behalf of Intas that you have given your valuable time to this session. And I believe the most of the audience are very much aware about the basics and detailed insights of optimizing sperm in uh, IUI and pregnancy. I will take some uh, questions, sir. Most of the questions have been answered in your presentation only. Uh, there were the questions in which case uh, we need to use gonadotropin for male infertility. See, um, gonadotropin in male infertility has been proven for hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, you give SCG. We need to understand two things. Um, SCG is a replacement for LH and HMG or FSH is what you give for FSH. So the intratesticular testosterone will only improve once you have given hypogonadotropic patients 
injections of LCG. I told you the dose in which they need to be given. You've got to tabulate it with the body weight of the patient, the response, the increase in size of the testes, and the increase in testosterone which would take place. So the first thing which you need to give these patients is HCG, wait for the testosterone to come up, see the testicular size to improve, and once the testicular size has improved, you would add FSH to it first. Second, a lot of papers have now come up where, where the FSH in the patient is not high, and you could give these people HMG. Now, HMG in these people is normally given in the dose of 75 international units twice a day, or recombinant FSH also could be given in the same dose. There are a lot of papers which have come out. In a few idiopathic, you can try it. And the response today of the papers which are there, there is a 2021 public going into publication at the moment. And the response which is going into there is tremendous. So we'll have to wait to see how large legonotrophins would be used in male fertility. Right, so uh, the second question is, uh, uh, which antioxidant do you recommend for the male infertility or aegospermia cases? I had given you a photograph of the chart. Right. In fact, I'll have your mails. I'll send you a beautiful paper. This paper is eye-opening. Believe me, I think sometimes human beings put in so much of an effort in life, and they put in this effort for only one reason to be able to bring out things to people. This paper not only gives us the doses, it also gives us the indications where it could be used. But anyway, since you've asked me this question, my mainstay is five things. Vitamin E, vitamin C, zinc, selenium, and folic acid. And I add to it three things, if needed. Coenzyme Q, lycopene, and carnitine. The doses of this is standard, 500 milligram vitamin C, 500 <coughs> milligram vitamin C, 400 to 800 international units of vitamin E, zinc, selenium, folic acid, and along with it, coenzyme Q, which normally is about 200 to 300 milligram, uh, milligrams. You can also add one particular thing, which is a very cheap drug, n acetylcysteine In fact, during COVID, this was the drug which was used phenomenally. Uh, right. Let me be honest with you, whatever drug you have used for COVID, which is an antioxidant, is the same which is going to be used for sports. Right, sir. Sir, another one is, is there any role of abstinence before giving IY sample? Well, if you have an abstinence of three to five days, the indications earlier were that the sperm quality and quantity was better. So if you have an abstinence for three to five days, great. But there is also a few pieces of literature which has come up that if you give frequent ejaculations, the DNA fragmentation is less. So in case there is a high DNA fragmentation which you have, and you have been getting treatment for that, you may not like to wait for three to five days and like to give an earlier sample. Right, sir. And uh, this last question was asked by uh, so many people. Like, which sperm preparation method do you suggest for oligospermia patient? I'll answer this in four ways. First, what do you consider oligospermia where you think IUI is going to be successful? There is no point of doing any IUI in any man who has a, a sperm count less than 5 million. First. Second thing is, if it is a normal spermic, you would like to do a swimmer. But if it is an oligospermic, which debris, density gradient is better. However, the Cochrane review suggests that either of them have an equal pregnancy rate. So uh, these are the questions, sir. And the most of the questions has been already been answered in your presentation. So once again, and uh, there are so many people, they are saying, thank you so much for doing this. So uh, most probably, I believe, uh, I, I request you to please uh, announce our second episode of this Optimizing Gamuts. Uh, from your words, it will be great. If you can- Dekhi, uh, aapko, aapko aaj na, aaj aapko Vinod badi sundar cheez sunata hon. Aur pata kya sunata hon? Ma aapko kya sunata hon? Kumar Vishwas badi khubsurat cheez kahe gai. Aur ye, yes, sir. Nails ke liye important hai. 
और मेल फर्टिलिटी की बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट है कि ना पाने की खुशी है कुछ ना खोने का ही कोई गम है ना पाने की खुशी है कुछ ना खोने का ही कोई गम है ये दौलत और शोहरत सिर्फ कुछ जख्मों का मरहम है अजब सी कश मकश है रोज जीने में मरने में अजब सी कश मकश है रोज जीने में मरने में मुकम्मल जिंदगी तो है मगर पूरी से कुछ कम है तो अगर आप मुझसे पूछे ना मैन हु कम्स टू यू इन द्लिनिक विद काउंट हैज अ डिफरेंट माइंड सेट you need to be with him and because of this reason i had a discussion with dr jatin and we going to have the second program which is very important believe me it's going to be is going to be the program of optimizing ova and sperm in art ixi so in ivf ixi this is going to be on the 16th and we going to meet, meet on the 16 and i'm trying another thing i am trying to ask dr jatin to have another program on optimizing ova and sperm naturally i'll tell you why because we do not concentrate on that and most of the patients want us to tell them how can they what can they do naturally i have this uh, youtube video which has gone viral and that is the best things to do to increase sperm count naturally i never realized and since i do this work i tell my patients 12 tips and tricks which they should do with the medication which i give to them and these people really want to do something and till you tell your patient you need to do this yourself and this is what i'll do for you you do not become partners and it's very important for a patient and us to be partners so uh it's a beautiful video i'll also send the link of that video in the email so i'm i'll i'm going to send you a couple of papers which you're going to read and they are landmark papers the moment you read things will get clarified and along with that i'm also going to send you this video of 12 tips and tricks to increase the sperm count and the second on the 16th is going to be on art xc how to optimize ovary and sperm and the third is going to be if dr jatin agrees is how to increase ova how to have better or optimize ova and sperm naturally for your patient yes. and so, i yes. think that's going to be amazing and we know yeah. thank you very much this announcement has been done and yeah. hope to see all of you 100% on the 16th and uh, would really like to have you with us and thank you very much for being here and i hope it's been useful to you thank you definitely sir thank you so much sir thank you so much for your valuable presence today and i would like to thank my all audience those who have participated today and uh, the necessary uh, documents and the research paper will be uh, sent to your mail id which we have uh, registered today with your name and your mobile number sir thank you once again thank you so much thank you jatin sir for being the part of this event